There is an old elevator in the academy. It is in a serious state of disrepair, and most of the academics choose to use the stairs instead. It regularly stops in between floors, or else operates as if it had a mind of its own. I often need to move a lot of box files between floors, and I use the elevator more than most of the other clerks and academics. The elevator is about twice the size of a telephone box, and access is gained by pulling open two heavy and awkward folding gates. Apart from passenger transport, the elevators are also used for other purposes, including deviant sexual practices, and also as a den for narcotics. It is widely believed that the elevator is used as a secluded place for the trading of secrets between sections of the academy. There is a single large lamp in the elevator, but at no stage in my memory has it ever worked for more than a day or two at a time. Water from several leaks on the roof makes its way into the elevator shaft and shorts out the electric circuit at the junction box. Once the two heavy folding gates are shut, selecting the appropriate button is achieved by a combination of feel and experience in the darkness. The elevator malfunctioned while I was in it with some box files a week ago. I was taking the files to the exchange on the ground floor where they were needed. The exchange is reached by pressing the button marked G on the control console of the e elevator. This is the easiest button to find on the console. I'm sure I pressed the correct button, but the elevator shuddered and jolted and then seemed to drop suddenly down the shaft out of control. At first, I thought the cables might have broken. The elevator finally stopped with a grinding sound against the outer wall of the shaft. I was in utter darkness. The papers from the files I was carrying were left scattered on the floor of the elevator. The whole elevator felt as if it was askew to the right in the shaft. I picked myself up off the floor and pulled the two stiff gates open. I could only pull them apart enough for me to squeeze out. The jagged edge of the gates tore my waistcoat and my shirt. I tripped and stumbled out onto the floor. The elevator had stopped about a half foot below the floor level. A small red light illuminated a sign above the elevator entrance. Basement. I had not known of the existence of a basement in the academy. Nobody had ever spoken about one not even the security officers. The air in the basement was dusty and stuffy and there was a strong smell of decaying wood or carpet. The floor was made of concrete and in the distance I could hear the sound of splashing water. I could also hear rats scurrying about on the floor. The only source of light in the basement came from several small red emergency lights high up on the walls. The light was also strong enough to see objects in my immediate path. I moved slowly forward, hoping somehow to find a way back upstairs. Once I got back upstairs, I could return with a torch and retrieve my files, which had been scattered on the floor of the elevator. I heard the rats screeching as they scattered away from me towards the edges of the walls. After some investigation, I discovered the basement was L-shaped. I could see light from the far back wall of the basement. It came from a desk lamp where I could see the figure of a man dressed in blue overalls sitting at a table. This area of the basement was far brighter than the other side and I could make out shelves of books lining the walls as I made my way towards the man. The light was, too, was still too dim for the purpose of reading any of the books on the shelves. I approached the desk and greeted the man he was busy writing. 
and he didn't look up or acknowledge my greeting. He was at least sixty, with a thin and bony body. All that remained of his hair was two grey clumps above each ear. He wore an editor's cap that cast a long shadow over his face. He could only be in this position of a clerk or porter if he worked in the basement. It stood to reason. I called to him again and I told him there was something wrong with the elevator. After a few moments he stopped writing and leaned back in his chair. The elevator's broken. I need to get out of this place. He leaned forward and uncovered an old black telephone from under a bundle of crumpled papers. He didn't reply to me but spoke in whispered tones to somebody on the telephone. They're doing all they can upstairs. You'll have to wait a while. I noticed the entrance to the stairway was heavily boarded up and it seemed it had not been used for years. I spent some hours in the basement waiting for the elevator to be repaired. I learned that the man was called Portman and he was a storage clerk. He'd worked for the academy in the basement for most of his life and he busied himself sifting through the thousands of outdated and duplicate files completed for the academy over the years. He also looked after the indexing of all books removed from the library upstairs and he stored them on the shelves which lined all the walls in the basement. He seemed completely unaware and unconcerned about the daily happenings in the academy and the region. It was some time before he became talkative. But once he removed a wine bottle from his desk drawer, he seemed to look upon me as less of an intrusion. He was eager for me to examine the books and the curious array of objects in the basement. These books date back 200 years and many of them are badly decayed, almost unreadable. Others simply crumble into dust when I pick them off the shelves. It's such a shame. He walked over and picked one book from a shelf, deliberately crushing it into dust under the strength of his fingers. I thought their poor condition was due to a combination of age and lack of use while they were in the academy's library. There were visible streams of water dripping down onto the shelves and many of them had been gnawed away by the rats. It was obvious that the books had simply been discarded here with no attention given to their preservation. There were many rows of jars filled with what I first thought was ordinary soil. The simple yellow labels on the jars described them as human ashes. Each included a surname and occupation. Portman showed me the jars containing the ashes of several of the region's great writers and leaders of the past. It was the intention of the Academy to spread these ashes on any new soil claimed by the region on behalf of its new generation. It's widely believed that the Academy deliberately had great men and women of the region put to death for the purpose of obtaining their ashes while they were still living at the height of their ability. On every shelf and in every corner, I saw rats moving around. There was a large glass jar filled with water on top of an old wooden beer barrel. I could see what seemed like a goldfish moving in the jar, and tiny groups of air bubbles rose to the surface of the water. When I looked at the jar more closely, I realised it was a human fetus floating in the water. I could make out all the features of the body while I floated in its fetal position below the surface of the water. And at all times, the fetus kept its tiny hands clenched and its eyes firmly shut. The clerk got up from his desk and walked over to me with his wine glass in one hand. He removed a small, colourful container from his waistcoat pocket and handed it to me. I read the ornately printed label on the container. Nutritious fish food, suitable for goldfish, guppies and other small sea fish. Advised amount should never exceed one quarter of a teaspoon. I opened the container and sprinkled a small amount of the orange powder on the surface of the water in the large jar. Immediately, the fetus rose to the surface and fed on the powdered particles of food. After feeding, the fetus returned to its resting position in the jar. 
The clerk plucked a pencil from his pocket and began storing the water in the jar. The fetus spun fiercely around in the swirling water. The clerk took delight from the frantic movements of the fetus as it tried to grab hold of the end of the pencil. The jar rocked about on the barrel before crashing to the concrete floor. The jar shattered into dozens of glass shards. The water splashed our feet and we both jumped back from the pool of water. The fall had clearly injured the fetus badly. It had several deep cuts on its back and it was slumped face down in the pool of water. Blood mixed slowly with the water before we noticed a few twitches from the tiny body. I bent down to look at it closely and gasped deeply for air before finally lying in silence. The clerk picked the body up off the floor and placed it on an empty shelf. I was fixed rigid to the spot by the spectacle I had witnessed. You must take it away with you when the security men arrive to get you out of here. He picked the fetus up off the shelf and pushed it towards my chest. I could feel its cold and wet body penetrating through my chest and my eyes fixed in the hands of the clerk holding the lifeless body. Portman laughed and returned to his desk with the fetus. It was several hours before the academy security managed to repair the elevator. It was dark and peaceful outside, but I could still feel the oppression and coldness of the academy long after I returned home to my apartment. I experienced a restless night. My brief periods of sleep were troubled by visions of that fetus in its last throes of death. The academy security has subsequently denied any knowledge of the existence of a clerk working for them in the basement. I've been down there on more than one occasion, but as yet I've been greeted by nothing more than the rats. There's no trace of the clerk's desk with a wooden beer barrel. The only things which remain in the basement are the shelves of its books and the jars of human ashes. I have checked the academy employment files and found that there was nobody listed by the name Portman. I'm quite sure my experiences in the basement were not simply a vivid dream of some kind. There is a cinema in the city not far from the academy where I always went as a child. All cinemas in our region are owned and run by the academy. In the old days the cinemas were privately owned and the choice of film screened adhered to the personal tastes of the owner. The best years of the cinema occurred when I was a young child and there was no one to force us to go. Since the academy took over the running of the cinemas we sometimes have to sit through multiple screenings of a single film. We come to know the images on the big screen as if they were as real and true as the snow which covers our streets outside. I've only once seen a film repeatedly by choice. My mother took me to see an animated film about a giant blue whale six times. Each Friday evening, after our meal, I would pester her to breaking point to take me the following day to the cinema. She used to take a book into the cinema with her and read it under the strong light of the cinema foyer. I would sit on my own in one of the front seats, absorbed by the flickering images, as if it was my very first time to see the film. I grew to understand the way the camera moved around its actors and how the light would illuminate their faces. It was the wild sea and the great sweeping tail of the giant blue whale that provided my first cinematic fascination. These early adventures developed within me a keen interest in adventure documentaries. The first documentary had been the Kulik film, which was shown in our cinema under the strict control of the Academy. It was one of a small handful I went to see eagerly, without the needless prodding of a soldier's rifle. A few years ago, 
I began thinking seriously about my mother's career in the cinema. Not being very long after her death, she'd given up her acting career before I was born. My recollections of her experiences and memories, which she recounted to me in the cinema, have been coloured by the passing of years. I never thought of her as an actress when I was a child. It was following her death that I realised her experiences were not the same as the mothers of my young friends. Her flirtation with the film industry began at the age of seven and lasted through to her early thirties. Her first screen roles were in a series of French black and white films made at a small studio in Chirols. She spent most of her teenage years acting in this studio for an Italian director until it closed after the last war. She quickly tired of the conventional European films. She began acting in art house films in France and Russia. Some of these experimental art house films have only just become available in the underground network below our city. The French films were considered at the time to be pornographic and only one of them has been screened in our region to date. Some months ago, some scenes cut from these films surface in the underground cinemas that have been outlawed for years by the Academy. The Academy has now officially criminalised the production and screening of unauthorised films in the region. Nevertheless, illegal screening has become popular in the underground, despite despite many arrests and convictions. My mother never enjoyed much popularity, but she did remain a highly respected actress within the experimental field of the cinematic industry. The resurfacing of the experimental French films in the underground cinemas has greatly changed the widespread opinion of her. I dare not utter her name to my superiors in the academy, and I've only discussed her film career with my wife. Her career ended after the suicide of a close friend and confidant. By the time I became fully aware of my mother's film career, the Academy had suppressed most of them, along with many other films of an artistic and experimental nature. I've seen two of the early French black and white films she made when she was young, and a few scenes cut from the experimental films screened in the underground cinemas. It is always a risk going to the underground cinemas because of the many raids and arrests recently. If the Academy ever finds out about the true identity of my mother, I'll probably face immediate expulsion from my post there. The city dates back to the Middle Ages, when it was a northern fortified settlement located on the banks of the river Voltaref. It is a city of high pointed spires and narrow streets which hide craft, workshops and lined foreheads of many weary alchemists. It's a city with a buried culture to hide. There were many underground tunnels and chambers channeled deep under the city during the Middle Ages when it was first built. They were used by the early settlers as shelters from the severe snowstorms which were common during that time. They were also used during the last two wars by the occupying armies as a safe command centre from heavy aerial bombing. The underground network is now used by the criminal and cultural underworld and it forms the nerve centre for the black market. The first of the underground cinemas began about five years ago and it still remains the largest and most successful of all the cinemas. There are generally about six at any one time operating frequently during the milder months of the year. The screenings range from art house films to hardcore pornography and notice of screenings is usually advertised with handout flyers in the local city bars and restaurants. Admittance is restricted to a recognised clientele. The cinema viewing areas comprise simply of a real projector beamed onto a white wall of a chamber. The cinemas are capable of moving quickly from one area to another to avoid detection and infiltration by academy military personnel. Several cinema operators and film directors have recently been arrested and screenings are becoming more secretive and less frequent. Only those visitors to the underground recognised as regular clientele bearing an identity card are admitted into the cinema chambers. The underground has become such a haven for drug trafficking and prostitution 
that few outsiders, unfamiliar with the day-to-day life of the underground, will risk going down there.